I mean, London for me has always been a mythic place. I, I love myth. I mean, myth is, myth is what I eat, myth is what I sleep, myth is what I dream and breathe and drink. And I love the myths of cities. And I remember as a, I must have been nine or ten, um, at school in Sussex, playing this game called something like the London Underground. And you had a board, which was the London Underground map, and you have to move your counters around the underground. And I'd look at the names of these underground stations. There'd be Oxford Circus, and White City, and Angel Islington, and Blackfriars. And I'd start wondering what they were like. Who was the angel? Um, what were the Black Friars like? What was, was there a circus at Piccadilly Circus or Oxford Circus? Did it have clowns and beautiful women and strange animals? And that for me was my first encounter with the tube. So from after that, whenever I travel by the tube in London, it would always be somehow slightly magical. And now in about, when was it, 19... 83, 84, 85, round about then, there were a bunch of novels that came out all at the same time. There was uh, John Crowley's Little Big, Mark Halperin's Winter's Tale, and Gene Wolfe's Free Live Free. And uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Tappan King and Vida Polycarpus's Downtown. And these were all novels set in American cities. Uh, New York or Chicago mainly, and they, the, the city seemed to be as much a character as the people. And I thought, that's really what I'd love to do with London. I'd love to write a novel. I'd love to tell a story which makes it magical again, which makes the city magic, um, which would give people the idea that the city is as magical, as strange, as deep as anywhere in fairy tale. I said where Never Where Began or where, what was, we know now as the TV series. When did, when did that, that was originate? De that was definitely the, the, the starting point for me for the whole idea of London above, London below, and maybe taking some of these places literally. The TV series started, it was 1991, I think, or possibly 1990, and I was a judge for the Arthur C. Clarke Awards. Read every single science fiction book published that year in England, and then the judges all get together and argue. And we got together in this club in London called the Groucho Club, and we were arguing. And at the end of a long day's arguing, we were all tired out. Lee Henry, who was an English actor and comedian. And American audiences would know him from? Chef. Chef, Chef I suppose, is probably the, the most famous thing they'd know him from. Um, some might know him from a thing called Bernard and the Genie, and from a very bad film that Lenny was very good in a very bad film called True Identity. And Lenny called me over. And I knew Lenny anyway because we'd worked together on some charity stuff, the Comic Relief comic. And uh, he said, look, I'm starting a company called Crucial Films. And I've been talking to the BBC, and they've said that they'd like me to do a fantasy TV series for the 1990s. Um, do you want to write it? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, do we have any kind of subject? And he said, no. He said, the only idea I've got is I thought it might be really cool if it took place amongst tribes of homeless people in London. And I said, that's an interesting idea. Let me think about it. And I went home. And I thought about homeless people that I'd known, and home, you know, I had some fr several friends who were homeless. Yeah. Um, and I thought about this, and I thought about the influence that television can have on people. And I wrote Lenny a long fax, and I basically said, look, I don't want to do tribes of homeless people, because 
I could make it really, really cool. It's a fantasy series. I could make it seem really cool to be homeless in London. It's not cool. I don't want some 14-year-old girl in Liverpool who's been abused by her uncle to run away from home to live on the streets of London because she's seen how cool it is on television. I said, let's take it as a metaphor. Let's look at the idea of the homeless, of the dispossessed, of the people who fall through the cracks, and make it a metaphor. Um, and that's what we did. So that was, that was very much the whole idea of London below and London above crystallized at that point. The idea, the awful thing about the homeless is after a while you train yourself not to see them. Um, I don't know what it's like where you live, but in London, you go down the Strand at night, every single shop doorway has one or two or three people sleeping rough. There. Um, you train yourself not to look. You practice not seeing. Somebody will say to you, you know, can you spare a coin? And you act as if they're not there. And the second you've managed to walk past them, you forget them. And I thought, I want to take that mechanism. I want to take the, the invisibility of the homeless and, again, crystallize the metaphor. I, a lot for me of fantasy is the idea of just, just making metaphors concrete. How did uh, Brian Eno and everyone, the director, get involved with the project? Were you in, instrumental in getting them on board? Brian Eno was me and Lenny. Uh, we were talking about who we'd like to do the music, and we both said, Brian Eno. And we thought, well, I'll never do it, but we should ask him. And uh, Lenny got in touch with Brian, and he said, come on over and have lunch and we'll talk. And to be completely honest, you know, I'm a huge Eno fan. Lenny's a huge Eno fan. All we wanted out of it was to actually get to sit, have a cup of tea and a smoked salmon and, and cream cheese bagel with Brian Eno. Um, we expected him to say no. So we sat there, we told him the thing, and we said, got to the end of the, the sort of explanation of what it was about. And I said, by the way, there is no money in this. Mm. And he said, well, there never is for the things you want to do, is there? And that was the point where we realized that Brian was on board. That's great. And I, you know, he did some strange and wonderful musical things, a lot of computer-generated music and stuff. Um, mostly that was how we got everybody. That there was a, the producer on Neverwhere, Clive Brill, was on board from the very beginning, pretty much. Um, he said that he was actually working in script development and the first script landed on his desk and he thought, right, I want to be part of this. And he more or less attached himself to it as producer. Mm. And Dave McKean? Well, Dave McKean's my... I've, I've known Dave now and worked with Dave for 13 years, something like that. We've been working together. Um, so he was the obvious choice to do the, the title sequence. He also, right in the very, very beginning, I did the outline and he went away and did a bunch of paintings and drawings that we were actually able to show the BBC to say this is what kind of thing we're talking about. This is how it could look. And uh, I love what he did. I'm actually, my one cameo in Neverwhere, people say, do you get a cameo or anything? And I do, uh, because I'm the running, the figure that runs under the bridge in the opening sequence. And that was just because Dave McKean came down to these tunnels under London where we were shooting some stuff. I think we were shooting the Knightsbridge sequence that day from episode two. And he had one handheld camera and a light. And he needed somebody. And the only person who wasn't doing anything was me, because I was the writer. And they didn't really need me around at all. I mean, they had to put up with me and feed me, but really, I, you know, I didn't have anything to do. Uh, so Dave said, well, come on. He said, I, you know, I'll borrow you. And he made me run down this hallway a dozen times, wearing his cloak. I, I borrowed his sort of rather cloak-like coat, and it flapped behind me. And then he created all that strange imagery that you see on his computer and joined the two things together. How successful did you feel was the realization of your screenplay? 
And how close did they get to realizing your vision? Well, I'll put it this way. I went off and wrote the novel immediately after. In fact, I started writing the novel on the first day of shooting, more or less in order to be able to go, no, this was what I meant. Um, and that was because, as a novelist, you have total power. And with a, if you're making TV, if you're making films, uh, it's like trying to paint a picture using an army. You know, you're, you're trying to give you an example. Um, the costumes. In the script, I'd written Door with a big leather jacket, a big, very brown leather flying jacket on that I wanted to be too big for her and that she'd sort of huddle in. And I was talking to the costume lady and I was saying, so, uh, you know, she was showing me costume designs. I was saying, these look terrific, really cool, really interesting. Um, what about Door's leather jacket? And she says, no, she said, I think there's too much leather. So I've given her this parka. And a purple parka was not, you know, puffy purple parka was not what I wanted the character in. And it was what she's in on the TV. You know, she winds up on the TV dressed a lot like my character Death for some reason, uh, which was more or less decided on the first morning of shooting when the first costume they'd done for her just didn't look right. And they just sort of stripped it down and put her in basic black. Um, so what was fun for me in the novel was I got to go back and recostume everybody. And some of them, I'd actually go back to, I'd steal from the TV series. I thought the Marquis coat, you know, I'd written this big coat from, I think it would have been red in the script, but I thought that huge black coat was just so amazing that that crept back into the novel. What else in the shooting uh, on the series did you find better than you'd hoped? And what didn't work out uh, nearly as well as you'd hoped? Well, the biggest problem was simply the fact we were shooting it all on location. The whole show, there's maybe two days in studios. There's two, two sets. Everything else is a location, either a real location or occasionally a dressed location. Um, if we're somewhere, we really are there. Do not grumble about cardboard BBC sets. There are no cardboard BBC sets. We're there. Um, the floating market in two. There was so much stuff there. There were so many people. We had, you know, 200 extras. You see maybe 10 of them on the screen. You don't get a sense of the hugeness and the wonderfulness and the intricacy of this because there wasn't time. You know, we got the scenes that we needed shot, shot, but there was no time to do just the little stuff. Um, And then, of course, there's the Great Beast of London. And in the script, the Great Beast of London was a boar the size of an elephant. It was a giant boar. Um, it, sort of like Moby Dick, it had these the, 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 um, swords and spears from bygone battles and stuff embedded in its hide, this giant albino creature from, you know, red-eyed, wickedly tusked, able to, to disembowel a person. And uh, this is what I wrote. And that's what I figured, you know, we set aside a lot of money, we were going to be making the boar. And then the director and the producer went off to see some boars to you know, find some real life boars that they could cut into and stuff. And they came back and they said, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? They said, well, the boars in England, there may be wild boars on the continent, but the boars in England have been uh, crossbred with pigs to make them um, amenable, friendly, and so on and so forth. And all of the boars that we've been able to find look like and are fuzzy things who would do anything for a cream bun. And I said, okay, well, so what are we going to do? Just build this as an animatronic? They said, no, no, no. They said, we've got a better idea. Look at this. And they showed me this photo. And I said, what's that? And they said, that is Albert. Albert is a Highland cow. I said, but I didn't write a Highland cow. They said, no, no, no. It'll be a Highland cow. It'll be brilliant. 
And furthermore, you don't have to worry at all because we're going to make up the cow. We're going to do prosthetics for its face and stuff. We'll do, um, you know, we'll have the, the swords and things coming out of its hide. So it won't look like a cow. It'll look like an alien kind of animal or something, half beast, half boar, half cow and stuff. And I said, well, okay. So I went to Australia. Uh, I was the guest of honor at the Australian National Science Fiction Convention. I went to Australia. I came back a week later and they shot all this footage and I, I have piles of tapes waiting for me, all the dailies, and I put them in and it's a cow. There is no mistaking it. It's definitely a cow. It comes around the corner. It's a cow. You can even see the, uh, you know, the, the ring in its nose. And at one point, you can even see, in fact, it actually made it into the series. You can see the guy leading it. Um, you can see the lead as it lumbers around the thing. And I said to the guys, this is, the, it's a cow. And they said, well, yes. I said, what happened to all this stuff about making it up? And they said, well, I said, uh, have you ever tried to make up a Highland cow? <laughs> He said it wasn't very friendly. It definitely wasn't very happy about being led through all these sewers, and uh, we couldn't make it up. So I thought that was disappointing. In many ways, that the whole thing of the great beast was the thing that gave me the impetus to work on Never Wear the Movie. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm writing Never Wear the Movie, and Jim Henson Pictures are going to be making it. And it'll be a live action thing with real people, but I just love the idea of working with Henson's because I figure they will give me a great beast that isn't a cow. Where did some of the recreational activities <laughs> come from? Well, actually, the, 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 the one that everybody really remembers was invented on set, uh, which is Frog Golf. It was not me. Uh, Frog Golf was, was Dewey Humphreys, and I think the art director came up with that. Uh, which I think is very funny, just the way they, they, they put the frog down and you see him playing golf with these frogs. Um, the, the razor blade thing and the knife is actually, I think, of all my, my favorite moment in Neverwhere. I, I really like that moment. I like watching Mr. Croup throwing his little razor blades and getting them all in and then Mr. Vandermark pointing out that he didn't even hit one finger and doing it his way with his knife and just sort of you know, it's, it says an awful lot about those characters. And what I love about that scene as well is it's the kind of scene which really, it's made for, for watching. Um, I put it in the book because I love it, but it doesn't work in the book. You can't see it. You can't see Mr. Vandermar's expression as, as he tugs at his hand. You, you, you can't see, um, and it wouldn't really work as a comic either because in a comic, you can't really see. Yes, the knife's gone through the hand, but it's not bleeding, and he doesn't really seem bothered about that. One of my favorite exchanges is the line from uh, uh, Merchant of Venice. If you cut me, do, do it. Yes, where he says, well, if, if you cut us, do we not bleed? And Mr. Vandermar ponders this for a moment and then says no. <laughs> the scene in, in the subway uh, where they're having their, their feast or dinner stands out in my mind as, as a really remarkable image, because that's a real train. Oh, yeah. Uh, whizzing by them. <laughs> in fact, that, that scene immediately after it, um, where you see the, um, the chandelier smash against the wall, um, was in real life immediately followed by the sound of somebody shouting, Cut! Oh, God, the chandelier smashed! And actually, we wound up keeping it in, because uh, it looks, it's such a great little moment, the smashing chandelier. Everything in... Neverwhere was created before scouting for locations except for that one scene. And that one scene was, I was, we were shown Down Street, which is the station that's been abandoned, closed down since the 1930s. During the Second World War, they actually turned Down Street Station into a secret war office. And um, Churchill had apartments there, Eisenhower, Trains would, underground trains would stop and they'd get off, and it has 12 feet of, of platform. And when they showed me this, when we were l just looking at, um, at, at places, I thought, that is so cool. 
I love this 12 feet of platform. I want to put a formal dinner party here. And then I had one of those conversations with the producer of the kind that people who um, work in television will have from time to time where they say, he said, look, this scene you've written in episode four um, is just too expensive. We can't do it. We can't justify it. He said, is there something else that you could write here? And I said, oh, yes, there really is. And I took this scene, which was set at the Mayfair and had you know, clowns and jugglers and hundreds and hundreds of people going on and stuff. And I took the scene and just put it on the underground platform. Has your experience with Neverwhere inspired you to try to direct or yes, work towards directing? Definitely. Um, I think the director on Neverwhere, Dewey Humphreys, did an amazing job. I think he did a terrific job, and especially considering the budget and the practicalities of making it, if Dewey hadn't done it, it would never have got made. But what I found myself longing for during the whole filming process was the power of because I say so. Um, you know, I'd spent five years writing this thing and I felt like I was building something kind of like a Swiss watch. It all worked. And all of a sudden, things would be thrown out, things would be changed, scenes wouldn't happen, things would go over here. I'd suddenly get accents that I hadn't wanted them to have or they get looks or whatever that, that I hadn't intended. Um, and I didn't have any ability to say, you know, no, no, it's the way that I wrote it, and it's the way that I wrote it because I say so. Every image, whether it's a costume or a, a prop, a key or something, that you're very specific about the look of that, is that true? Or? I've been working in comics for so long where I had complete control over the imagery. And I got, you know, costuming on Neverwhere frustrated me no end. Um, I felt like I would have felt if I'd written in the script for Sandman, okay, he's wearing this big black cloak and, you know, these black clothes and stuff, and somebody had said to me, yeah, but we thought, well, there's too much black, and anyway, we've seen that look before. So right now he's wearing a zoot suit and a baseball cap. And so, like, it's not the same character. It's not what I had in my head. I know the imagery I'm going for here. Let me do that. Let me control the imagery. And in comics, of course, I get to write, you know, explicit directions for an artist of what I want things to look like. It seems like I read somewhere that there was a difference between the UK edition of the book Neverwhere and the one that was printed here in the, in the US. Is that true? What, what's the difference? What's the English edition of Neverwhere the novel and the American edition of Neverwhere the novel are fairly different books. Um, the American edition has lost about a thousand words and gained about ten thousand words if memory serves. Um, the English edition was written very, very fast. As I said, I started it on first day of shooting, which I think was the 8th of February, 1996. It had to be delivered on the 1st of May. Um, and during that time, we were also making the series. So I was writing very, very fast, um, trying to get it all straight in my head, trying to get it to work on the page. Handed in the novel, what I handed in was printed. We didn't even have time to fix it. Uh, we didn't have time to do anything to it. It just came out in order that the book could come out when the TV series came out. Um, Avon loved the book. I'd already wanted to go in and do a bunch more stuff to it for an American readership or for an international readership. Um, in England, I can say, he walked down Oxford Street. Everybody in England, whether they live in London or not, knows Oxford Street as well as anyone in America knows Fifth Avenue. They know this is the, sh this is the street with all the shops on it. Um, every Christmas, the lights are turned on on Oxford Street and stuff like that. I don't imagine that anybody in America will know that. So they might go, Oxford Street, uh, maybe it's got a university on it or something. You know. So I got to write a lot of stuff in the American edition that was just background. 
I try and sneak it in, I try and hide it, but there's a lot more description. I describe the world therein a lot more. Um, I treat London in the American draft of the book much as if I were talking about a, um, a city in a fantasy novel or a city in a historical novel. I don't assume you've been there. I don't assume you know anything about it. And if I'm going to make a reference to something later on in the book, I will now hide a reference to it earlier on so you will at least be able to figure out what I'm talking about. Um, there were other changes too. There are less jokes in the American version because my American editor said that she thought that Americans would have more trouble coping with something that was serious, which never were is, and had jokes in. She said, could you, you know, so I, I, we lost a lot of the jokes, which I, I regretted because I liked them, but I felt she did probably have a point. Um, and we lost a prologue. We lost an extra prologue with Mr. Krupp and Mr. Vandermar 400 years ago, watching a monastery burn down. And I have to drink some water. People occasionally say, well, I'm a structuralist and a formalist and stuff, but most of my structure tends to be instinctive. Um, structure tends to be the last thing I worry about. Structure tends to be the thing that is obvious once it's done. What's the first thing you worry about? Depends what it is. Um, with any story I do, there's always something that I have, one little thing to hold on to at the beginning. With Neverwhere, it was the idea of this nice, dull guy finding a young girl bleeding on the pavement taking her home, and by this one act, this one good Samaritan act of charity, having his life completely destroyed. And that was the thing that came to me right at the beginning. Everything else came sort of before or after that. Everything else, um, I mean, I wrote episode one without a clue really who the other characters were going to be. I, I, you know, I met De Carabas. I knew Hunter was out there, but didn't know what she was working, who she was working for or what she was doing. I knew that I wanted an angel in there called Islington. Um, I had the idea of Earl's Court. But really, I just, I just wrote from there. Um, it was, it was as much a matter for me of, of finding out what happened as it was for everyone else. I, I, if I were an actor, I would probably be much more of an improvisational actor than I would be somebody who likes rehearsing. I like the fun of just doing it and finding out. I love moments in the script or moments in the plot that are as much a revelation and moments of discovery to me as they are to the reader. Because if they're a moment of revelation and discovery to me, then they probably will be a moment of, of revelation and discovery to the reader. That's when, or the viewer, that's when things get really exciting, is when people go, I never realized that. And you want to act as if you knew it all the time, but very often you only realized it when you got there in the story. It suddenly became inevitable. Doing improvisation requires a lot of preparation. You have to bring a lot onto the stage with you if you're going to do improv. I mean, is, that, is that analogous to your writing style? I mean, are you doing a lot of research, oh, reading, yeah. reading what, constantly? And, is, and when you finally sit down to write, is writing a pleasure or is it difficult to actually make yourself sit down and hammer the words out? There are two kinds of writers. There are the kind who are never happiest than when they're writing and who you would have to stop writing by physically restraining them from writing. And then there's the rest of us. And I definitely come into the rest of us category. Um, I'm not as bad as someone like Douglas Adams, who you know has to be more or less locked into hotel rooms to ma be made to write novels. Um, but I'm not a, 
I'm somebody who will find excuses not to write. And, you know, I'll get up in the morning planning to write immediately. But then, you know, you have breakfast and then, then there's the few telephone calls to make. And then you have a bath. And then the mail comes and you have to do the mail. And then there are some more phone calls that have to be made from because of the mail. And then the kids come home from school. And then there's dinner to make. And then finally you realize there's nothing else you can do. You've done everything possible that day. You know, that you can't have another bath. Um, so at that point, I go and write. And normally at that point, I enjoy it enormously. I, I'm Mostly I'm a writer who enjoys writing. I laugh at my own jokes when I write. Prose, I love the complete control. I love the fact that it's just me. Don't have anybody else to worry about. Don't have anything else to worry about. It's just me. I'm doing my prose. Look, here's a word. If there's a word there, it's probably because I wrote it. Um, I will have fights with copy editors who change my commas. You know, I, I, and then there's comics. And in comics, what you're writing is a script. It's much more complicated and complex than a film script or a TV script. How many and words would the average issue run? Average, the like a Sandman script. Yeah. A Sandman script. The Sandman scripts were mostly 10,000 words, 10 to 14,000 words. Uh, for 24 pages of comics, um, which would normally have 1,500 to 2,000 words in word balloons. So, you know, 80% of what you were doing was, was instructions to the artist, telling them what to draw, explaining things, explaining how you wanted things to look or how you wanted things to work. Do comic book writing skills translate to screenwriting skills? Is, is the one kind of lead into the other? Um, you think they ought to. But I don't know. It seems when you're writing the screenplay, there, 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 there are different. There's a whole. You use different muscles, and you use different muscles for writing prose, different muscles for writing poetry, different muscles for writing comics, different muscles for writing radio plays, different muscles for writing TV and screenplays. I seem to be fairly competent at all of them. I figure I have a, still have a lot to learn, uh, particularly on screenplay stuff on, on that area. I'm still learning a lot right now. Um, but I, I get puzzled when people who are good at one can't do the other, because I'd expect you to be able to move from one to the other. It's like when you get a great novelist who's meant to be writing comics, or a great novelist writing a movie, and it's awful. What do you think you need to learn in terms of screenwriting? Is there a, something that you find particularly challenging? Well, screenwriting, the techniques of screenwriting are different. Things move. People talk. Uh, the one thing that I'm always learning and always just, just fighting with and trying to cope and stuff is how little dialogue you need in movies. My tendency is always to do what I would do in a comic or in prose, which is to do everything in dialogue. Um, but you don't have to. You can do things with a look. You can do things with a shrug. You can do things with a turn. You can do things with a smile. One of the things I also love about, um, particularly about writing Neverwhere, was just writing these characters and then watching actors come and inhabit them. And sometimes the performances were what I wanted, and sometimes they weren't. But in each case, it was just really cool. There was somebody inhabiting that. There was somebody saying the lines. What makes a story mythic? You know, or, or are all stories, do all stories have mythic elements, or is there something very specific that myth speaks to? I think a fundamental part of stories, being or feeling mythic, is the feeling that they go down a long way, that they have their roots somewhere in the subsoil. Um, that you're talking about stuff that's been going on for a long time. And also, mythic stuff feels right. I'm not sure I can put it any more distinctly or any more accurately than that, but it feels right. You know that the story sort of it has the right kind of shape. People ask me these days what the modern myths are. I always say I figure it's, it's urban legends. It's vanishing hitchhikers and microwave poodles and men with, with hooked hands following cars with 
you know, with lovers down lovers' lanes. Those are those are the myths we have now that we tell each other. And they seem to resonate with something deep. They, they resonate. There is a rightness to them. That's why people tell them to each other. Do you think there can be um, myths that a culture uses that are healthy, and myths that are neurotic? Oh sure. You know, I, mean, I mean, you know, this this entire century has been damaged beyond reckoning by the, the, the German myth that the Aryan nation was superior to all. And, you know, the, this sort of strange background of um, 800 years of Central European anti-Semitism. You know, this stuff is all mythic. You look at the Grimm's fairy tale stories about the evil Jews and the Jewish peddlers who always get, you know, delightfully killed in the end, very satisfyingly in the story. And all these, uh, you know, blonde-haired Germanic princes. And then you look at what that, that, those kind of myths did when people tried behaving as if they were real and acting them out. And all of a sudden, you have six million people in concentra dying in concentration camps. And uh, entire countries mucked up. And what is scary about that stuff, mythically, is it's happening again. You look at Germany right now. And they're getting very, they're getting back into all that stuff and, you know, bombing transient camps and killing dusky skinned people and that kind of thing. It's, it's very bad. People don't change. Um, and that, I think, from a writing perspective is very important. It's very easy to point at the people who lived 500 years ago or in the 1920s or in the time of Christ or in ancient China. And, and say, well, those, that was them, but we are now us, and we have come a long way. No, we're the, we're the same people that we were then. Um, and every now and then I'll write a story about it. There was a, a story I wrote in Sandman uh, called The Golden Boy about this. And, and really it was a tale of the American presidency retold as a synoptic gospel. And the whole reason for doing that was just watching the American reaction to the first year of Clinton and all these friends of mine who were so happy when he was elected. It was as if, you know, it was like some kind of strange second coming. He was going to come and sort everything out. And then everything he promised sort of slid out and fell. And then he's, he, he's making these deals and he isn't very good. And, and they were all personally let down as if, you know, they expected the second coming of Christ and they'd got a human being and they were really disgruntled by that. And so I thought, well, I think I'll just write a story about the kind of president that obviously the country at this point feels it ought to have. And I wrote this essentially a synoptic gospel, as I say. And it was a powerful story and it worked because it was mythic and because it felt right and just because it was talking about the presidency. Every industry, every industry to do with the arts in this country has its organizations that protect. When two live crew were arrested in Florida, you know, the entire music industry mobilized. You couldn't read about, you know, you couldn't avoid knowing about this. Um, on the other hand, when Mike Diana was arrested in Florida for drawing comics, and sentenced to three years in prison for drawing comics, and had that suspended with a, a sentence, actually served several days in prison, um, but eventually had it suspended with a, a sentence that included um, the fact that Mike was not allowed to have any contact with anybody under 18. He had to pay for, I think, psychiatric treatment. He had to pay for a journalistic course at his own expense. And he was forbidden by the uh, state of Florida from drawing or writing anything that anybody could possibly see as obscene. And the local sheriff's department was ordered to make random 24-hour checks of Mike's house, or Mike wasn't living in the house, his room, um, to make sure he wasn't committing art. Now this, and the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Um, this has never been front page news. This has never even been mentioned in any newspaper that I know of. Um, Mike's the first American artist to be convicted of obscenity. 
Are comics more vulnerable to this than other mediums? Yes, I think they are. And And why? I think one reason why comics are more vulnerable than other media is very simply that there is a rock bottom perception that goes like this. Words are good. Words are respectable. You can get the Nobel Prize for Literature with words. We have already fought battles for words. The Lady Chatterley's trial, the Henry Miller trials, these have been fought and won. We know that words are art and are respectable. Um, Pictures are respectable. People have been hanging pictures up for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, They hang in museums, they hang in the Louvre. Pictures are fine. Pictures, you can get, you know, you you can be a famous artist by doing pictures. Pictures are fine, grown-ups can look at pictures. But if you put words and pictures together, no matter how good the pictures and no matter how fine the words are, you are now suddenly automatically doing something aimed at children or at subliterates. And it's nonsense. It's obviously not true. But it's definitely a cultural prejudice. And it's one that has to actively be fought. People say to me, they say, you are English. Why are you so het up about the First Amendment? And why are you out there raising all this money for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund when you know, a lot of Americans aren't? And I explain to them that it's because I'm English. I come from a country without any First Amendment tradition. England has, instead of um, the First Amendment, we have an Official Secrets Act. We have an Obscene Publications Act, which actually says that there are things that are obscene that cannot be shown. And we have customs, which prohibits the importation of anything that any customs person doesn't like or considers obscene or anything. Um, we, you know, very, very restrictive laws about what you can say, what you can draw, what you can depict. And coming to this country where you actually don't, where you genuinely have free speech, I think is so important. It's something to be treasured. It's something that if you don't look after it, it will go away. And unfortunately, um, In this country, you have small town police departments and sometimes big town police departments who figure that they can, you know, if you're given the choice between actually doing something about crime and busting a comic shop for selling a pornographic comic to an adult, to the news to show that you're really doing something about the community, which are you going to do? And they bust comic shops. Um, the Legal Defense Fund has fought a lot of those. Uh, a few years back, the State of California Tax Department decided that comics were not art. They were not literature. They were, in fact, sign painting and would be taxed as sign painting. And they went after Paul Mavridis, who does the fabulous Fairy Freak Brother comics. And the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund raised over $100,000 to fight his case, uh, which if they'd actually won, comics would legally not have been literature and would not have been art. That's amazing. So, you know, these cases have to be fought, and the money has to be there for them. Some cases we win, some we lose. But if there wasn't a Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, there wouldn't be anybody. We don't have pen. We don't have you know, uh, any big organizations that look after comics and look after freedom of speech in comics. Do you think the tide is turning? Do you think comics are gaining legitimacy and and the respect that they deserve, or is it still an uphill battle? It's an uphill battle. I kind of figure, like, um, one of the reasons I did Sandman was to try and do a comic for adults. I felt like there wasn't enough stuff, and I felt this from the beginning with Violent Cases, my first comic, there wasn't enough stuff that you could point to. That was good. Enough stuff that you could point to that you could hand an adult and say, here, read this as a comic. If you're, you know, comics is a medium. It's not a genre. It is as good. It's like a 
pot or a bottle. It's as good or bad as what you put into it. Um, the argument that comics are somehow inherently for kids is as silly as if the first films had been animated cartoons for kids. And people had gone, what a great medium for kids. And then you've had a hundred years of animated films for kids. And now some people are going along saying, well, actually, you can make Citizen Kane. You can make these films. You don't have to. And people are getting all upset because what you're not making anymore is animated films for kids. It seems. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, so with Sandman, I wanted to write a comic that I would like. And when I began writing it, I think I was 26 or 27. When I finished, I was about 35. Um, I was writing a comic for me that somebody who was like me would enjoy, uh, with all the subtlety that I could put in, with all the poetry that I could put in, with all the weirdness and adventure and what have you. But it wasn't, I wasn't writing it down for anyone. And I wasn't trying to, it wasn't pretentious in the sense that I was pretending to do anything. This was the kind of comic I wanted to read, and nobody else was doing it, so I wrote it. It seems that, that part of the reaction, uh, at least this is my theory, that part of the reaction to comics says something about the power of, the power of combining words and images in the same space, that there's something that it asks the viewer uh, or the reader, the, the person experiencing it, to do that simply, you know, that just reading doesn't do and just looking at a picture, that, that those elements combined are very powerful in some way. I think there is, there is an impact that you get from comics that you have from almost no other medium. Um, but it's also a very, very easy medium to take out of context. You can take a panel from a comic and print it in a newspaper and say, this is what our children need to be protected from. You can't do that with a passage in a book because somebody has to actually read it. And you can't do it with a film because once somebody actually sits and watches 10 minutes of a film, they'll probably go, oh, well, yeah, it seems to be, you know, maybe it's art or whatever. Um, you can do it occasionally with photographs, you know, the Mapplethorpe kind of stuff, and you can do it very, very easily with comics. Take a, pass take a panel, which may, in context, be very obviously part of something much bigger, and say, look, look at this, it's, it's evil, you know, he's digging the thing into her eye, whatever, our children need to be protected from this. And America has had a history of doing this, I mean, starting in, in 1954 with Dr. Frederick Vertum and his book, Seduction of the Innocent, where he demonstrated that all juvenile delinquency and every problem that America was having was directly traceable to crime comics, by which he meant every comic that wasn't uh, Disney or Gold Key. And this is what led to the hearings and... The, the, the Senate hearings that wiped out the EC Comics list and uh, later the Comics Code and various other things. And a point at which comics really did become for kids after that. Um, but, you know, Frederick Werther, I mean, he was completely bats. There's one famous panel where he points to... He's, got, he's found a panel of a man's shoulder, a guy at the beach, and then behind him there's a woman. And he's convinced that the musculature in the shoulder that the artist drew actually is the woman's vulva. And he sort of puts this caption underneath saying, there are hidden pictures in comics if you know how to look for them. And you look at this and you think, life for Frederick Bertha must have been such fun. I mean, he must have had this wonderful life if he could see, you know, women's genitalia in every shoulder muscle. This, this must have... What a great life it must have been. What are you working on right now? Right this moment, I'm working on the Neverwhere movie, the second draft of the Neverwhere movie for Jim Henson Productions to be produced by Denise Denovi, who did all of Tim Burton's films, and directed by Jesse Dillon, who's Bob Dylan's son and a terrific director. Um, and I'm also writing the English language version of a Japanese film called Princess Mononoke, which is an animated Japanese film. Um, just beginning to put together a, an outline for a science fiction series, which would be an American network series that I've been asked to write, and putting together a deal with an American film company, which would allow me to um, direct, create, write, and more or less do whatever I want.
When should we start looking for Never Wear the feature film? Once with with a good headwind, maybe we'll be you know filming this year, and you could be watching for it next year. And with a bad headwind, early in the next century, I would have thought. It's Hollywood. Yeah. You never know. Krupp and Vandemar, the old firm, obstacles obliterated, nuisances eradicated, bothersome limbs removed, and tutelary dentistry, as he says at one point rather wonderfully. Where, what's the status on Death the Movie? I mean, we're in development, or...? Um, I have no idea. Warner, Warner's... Um, I really don't. They're, they're very strange people at Warner Brothers. And there's been um, rumors for years about a Sandman feature. Is I'm having nothing to do with nothing that. Nothing to do with that. And don't want anything to do with that. Right. I mean, I don't... Sandman feature is something where I look at it and I go... It's a Sherman tank. A Sandman movie, it's going to be a $100 million movie if it ever happens. Something like that is a Sherman tank rolling slowly down a hill. If you stand in its way, it will roll straight over you. Um, I've watched good people get attached to the Sandman movie, try and do stuff, and get fired. And it's quite possible that it will come out and it'll be brilliant. And it's quite possible it won't be made and so on and so forth. But I don't want to be involved. I don't. I did Sandman. I said everything I had to say. It, I, it's available in ten volumes. That's my story. And after that, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I, I just figured that everybody gets to create... Every, every writer gets to create one great occult book. You know, H.P. Lovecraft had the ne Necronomicon and so forth. So when I came up with mine, it was the Liber Fulvarum Paganarum, which literally translates as the book of yellow colored pages. I'm kind of like the all-purpose guest because there are all these different sort of Venn diagram groups of people who go to science fiction conventions. There's the people who like, you know, TV stuff and media stuff. There's the Babylon 5 fans. There's the comics fans. There's the science fiction fans, the fantasy fans, the horror fans. And I have so many feet in so many different camps that I'm one of the few people you can say, oh, well, the TV, you know, the media people will like it because they like Neverwhere. And the Babylon 5 fans will like it because Neil wrote an episode of Babylon 5. And the book people will like it because you know, he's done real books. He's written article, critical articles. I'm a proper writer. And then the comics people, you know, so I'm, I, I, I think I'm the ultimate all-purpose guest for, at a convention. You know. Neil is like the modern um, myth maker. He is the, the fabulous for our times. The type of things that he says and he writes about that's the type of thing that I think that is really pertinent to today's age. And science fiction, fantasy, whatever, it's some of the best things I think that has been written to date. Oh, Neil Gaiman is um, a wonderfully literate writer in any media he's done. I've read uh, comic books, I've read novels, I've read short stories, and the one thing that I know that when I read something by Neil, it's going to be a wonderful thing to read, whether it's funny or serious, it's going to be very good. I think he is the most important fantasist writing today. He is putting together elements that nobody else does and making them into a new whole that is like nothing we've seen. He's amazing. The only way I'm going to get this written in time is if I go and hide. 
And I phoned my travel agent. I said, do you have a copy of USA Today? And they said, yes. I said, good. Turn to the map on the back. And they did. I said, right, now, you can see where we are. It's purple. <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, send me somewhere orange. So I wound up writing chapters two and three, episodes two and three of the TV series of Neverwhere in Galveston, Texas, <laughs> in a hotel room. And it was orange. Uh, it was very strange, but it was orange. <laughs> then silence from the BBC. Complete, utter, dead silence. And just at the point, about nine months, a year later, I thought they've, they've given up on this. Nothing's going to happen. I got a phone call saying, Need episodes four, five, and six right now, please. <laughs> and this time I wrote them at home, because uh, the weather was warmer. And I was just finishing episode six when we got the green light. They said, yes, we're going to make it. By the way, it's still half hour episodes, and it's still on video. <laughs> so I went over to England. Um, actually, that's not entirely true. I didn't write it all at home. Episode four. I went to England for because we were doing a read-through of the first three episodes. So I was writing episode four in England. Um, and my friend Tori Amos had this bizarre house at the time. And boats, these canal boats, these long boats and things would just go underneath you. And the further down you went in the house, you could more, more you could hear water and things. It was this bizarre thing. It had once been like a lock keeper's house. And it had been... Uh, but it was the bridge. It was the structure of the bridge was the house. Which is why there's an awful lot of water in episode four. Lots of pe people keep getting pushed in the mud and getting wet and stuff. And that was, that was all to do with just looking out the window and you're writing and somehow it goes in there through the eyes and out onto the paper. This was like July, August of last year. And in LA, I had lunch with Joe Straczynski and Harlan Ellison after the signing. Now, over the years, Joe Straczynski is an incredibly polite and patient man. And six years ago, he sent me a package of stuff. And it was just a bunch of scripts and this Bible thing. And he said, I'm writing a TV series it's called Babylon 5. Will you do me an episode? And I said, I'm doing my own TV series. But when I finish it, when I'm done, I'll do you a Babylon 5 episode. So every now and then, he'd send me another batch of tapes or a batch of scripts. And once a month, Harlan and Joe, this may not be public knowledge, I may, I may be giving something away here, but once a month, Harlan and Joe and their respective wives get together and have dinner in LA. For some reason, whenever I would go into LA and I'd phone Harlan and say, right, I'm in town for a day, do you want to get together for dinner? He'd say, well, actually, having dinner with Str Joe Straczynski tonight, but do you want to come along? And I'd say, oh, all right. So I'd always come in on one of these dinners, which was great, because it meant I never paid. <laughs> um, because the deal is, Joe takes Harlan out one month, Harlan takes Joe out the next month, and there was no way to sort of fix me into this, so they just, you know, one of them would cover me. This is the, for four years, Joe or Harlan would pay for my dinner, and I would feel guilty. Which meant that every time Joe would say, so you can do an episode for Babylon 5 for me then? I would say, well, you know, I'm still doing my series. I'm still doing Neverwhere. But when it's done, I will do you an episode. So got the word back from the BBC in June that they weren't going to do another series of Neverwhere. They said, nope. Too expensive. And uh, the following week, I saw Joe, I did the signing at Dangerous Visions, Joe and Harlan, and Joe says, so, season five? I said, yeah. He said, no, no, really, you know, what about this? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do one. And he said, and, and Harlan's sitting there and he's going, what, nobody asked me? <laughs> what, do you think I wouldn't turn in an episode? Do you think I'd be late or something? Joe, why don't you ask me for an episode? Joe's going, I've been asking you for an episode for five years, Harlan. Yeah, 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 but, but ask me now. <laughs> so, uh, and I thought, this is good. I thought, maybe I can, if I write an episode, Harlan's going to finally do one. 
I was wrong on that one, but it was, a, it was a good idea. So I got a phone call, five days later, I get home and the phone rings and it's Joe Straczynski and he says, look, were you kidding about doing a Babylon 5 episode or do you really have time? I said, no, I really have time, I will do it. He said, great, I'll send you a contract, we're on. And the following day, I got the phone call to say, okay, never wear movie, it's a go. <laughs> And I couldn't face calling Joe and saying, I can't do it. I'm meant to be working on the Neverwhere movie script. So instead, when the people at Jim Henson Films phoned me up to say, OK, are you writing the film? I said, no, I'm doing an episode of Babylon 5. I'll start when I finish that. And they were like, y you're kidding, OK? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not. They've been waiting five years. <laughs> I, I really couldn't face ringing Joe and saying, I can't do it. So uh, these people in Hollywood are going, he's mad. <laughs> he's meant to be doing this feature film and he's doing this, what is it on, like TNT or something? You're doing it on, you're writing a TNT, like sci-fi show, what is this, Next Generation or something? No, it's Babylon 5, I'm doing it. And I said, so I'm gonna have, I want an alien race to basically construct a little era of, on Babylon 5, only it's not going to go quite the way people think. And I told him a bit about it, and he said, great, love it, good idea. I'm going to run it by my producers. He phoned me up a day later. He said, yep, they like it too. I said, okay, well, um, what's next? I said, do I, do I have to write you an outline? This is the moment that endeared me to Joe Straczynski forever. He said, do you like writing outlines? <laughs> I said, no, I hate writing outlines. He said, so do I. I said, good, then I have one very important question for you. And he said, 43 pages. <laughs>